Decades ago, in the era of chemical-based film photography, if the subject matter was in dim lighting conditions, or a subject moved very fast, camera film laced with chemicals to make it more photosensitive was used to speed up the ability of the film to capture light. That was chemical-based gain, and it came to be called ISO, which is unusual because ISO stands for International Organization for Standardization, but that's how language works. Associations happen, and then they become mainstream. But then film went the way of the dinosaur and was replaced by digital photography. Photographers still had to work with subjects in a wide range of light, or alternatively subjects that were moving very fast. And so, even in the digital world, gain remains as an important part of photography. But its nature changed. Instead of using chemicals to increase a film's sensitivity, digital cameras had sensors that were always at their maximum sensitivity to light. So gain was accomplished in another way. On one side of the equation, the analog signal that came from the photons was amplified. And on the other side of the equation, after the signal left the sensor, its brightness could be further digitally enhanced. But digital photography has also been around for decades now, and the way gain works continues to evolve. Now we live in an era where many cameras are ISO or gain invariant, and such cameras can magically seem to capture all gain potential at once, so that a photographer can simply adjust gain in post-processing. Other cameras have two or more gain processors, which is very much like giving them two or more standards to process light, and such cameras can handle a wide range of light very effectively. And some cameras have even abandoned the analog application side of gain altogether. They simply capture and store as much signal as possible, and then the gain can be digitally adjusted later on. This means that what gain is and what it does continues to evolve. For astrophotographers who work with subjects that are extremely distant and dark, it is especially important to understand gain because we must contend with factors that regular terrestrial photographers don't have to think as much about, such as how to maximize the amounts of information that our images capture, along with the effects of camera electronic noise and signal noise on images, and the wide depth of dynamic range necessary to capture some deep space objects. In this video, we'll try to decipher what this evolving gain is really all about, not so much as a circuit, but a process. In order to understand what it does to images and how it affects factors such as dynamic range, brightness, and noise, and even one's ability to shoot flat calibration frames. Let's dive in. This is an example of a good quality modern astrophotography camera. The Player One Aries camera, which is available in color and mono. The heart of any digital camera is its sensor right here in the middle of the circle. That little nine megapixel square is much like the retina of the telescope. It senses any light captured for later interpretation and usage. Specifically as a digital camera, the way it works is photons captured by the telescope and transmitted down to the sensor are captured and stored in little light buckets called pixels. Each pixel converts its photons into electrons. And after a designated period of time, each pixel will dump its collection of photons into the camera a processor in the camera will then assign a brightness value to each pixel based on the number of electrons it contributed. Then, the brightness recorded by each pixel becomes a building block of the image. Each layer therefore adds a little bit more information to the total image, till, exposure by exposure, an image of whatever DSO we are trying to film is slowly built up. But DSOs, with few exceptions, tend to be very dark. So much so that even through a telescope, we might see no more illumination than this. And when that happens, we astrophotographers quite reasonably become concerned about whether or not we are actually capturing useful information. So to deal with the lack of brightness, we amp up our gain. Let's raise it from 0 to 50. When we do, the objects we are attempting to film becomes brighter. It seems like we're capturing more information, doesn't it? And if increasing the gain allows the pixels of our camera to capture more information, why not increase it some more? Let's raise the gain from 50 to 100. The image appears to have gotten even brighter, and that's good, right? We must be capturing more information. Except, no. Because, contrary to appearances, and contrary to frequent misunderstandings, increasing the gain does not make a digital camera sensor more sensitive to light. In the old days of photography using chemical film, when it was said that the ISO of a film was increased, additional concentrations of photosensitive chemicals were actually placed on the film. So in fact, the film did become more sensitive to light. But the sensors of digital cameras are actually more sensitive to light than film. 
and not only are they more sensitive, but they always operate at their maximum sensitivity. Because of this, gain cannot actually make a sensor any more light sensitive, which also means that a sensor cannot give us any more information per unit of time. And if that's the case, then what exactly is gain doing? And here's where it gets really interesting. As previously observed, a pixel is like a bucket for photons. When a pixel is exposed to an object, photons, which are little packets of light energy, fall into the pixel. They're converted into electrons and stored up until the end of the exposure, and then the pixel's electrons are dumped into a processor in the camera where they are measured, and the processor assigns a brightness value to the pixel based on the number of electrons it counted. For illustration purposes in this video, we'll say that when the gain is set for zero, each electron counts for one point of brightness. This is a huge simplification for illustration purposes, however, but it helps to illustrate things and avoids technical rabbit holes that would make this video 20 hours long. Now let's say I'm trying to image a dim DSO. And after several minutes of exposure, the DSO doesn't look as bright as I want, and I'm worried about not getting enough information. One way I could deal with the dilemma is to increase exposure time. That would give more time for photons to fall into the pixel light buckets, and when each exposure finished, the subframe would look brighter. But there are certain technical challenges to that. The sky is full of satellites and aircraft, and if a satellite or aircraft, or even something unlikely like a falling star, were to trace across the field of view during a lengthy exposure, the subframe could be ruined. Also, increasing the exposure time of subframes places far greater challenges on the mount. If there are any flaws in the mount, longer exposure times will give them more opportunity to show up. And likewise, if the seeing is not ideal, or wind or some other issue crops up, longer exposure times can bring that out. So I go with option 2 and increase my gain, allowing me to get brighter pixels with the same amount of photons in the same exposure time. And the way the camera's processor makes pixels brighter is not by making the sensor more sensitive, but by modifying its brightness reference. Let me explain. Think of it like this. Gain correlates to a brightness reference. When the gain is at zero, the brightness reference is at full length. And if each of our pixels has a well depth of 10, that means each pixel can hold 10 photons. And when the brightness reference is at full length, it would take 10 photons or full well depth to make any pixel be interpreted as fully bright. Now again, please bear in mind that this is a simplification for illustration purposes. What's going on in the electronics is more complicated, and the pixel-to-gain relationship is not linear. But this is functionally accurate, and it's useful to keep things simple this way for illustration purposes. Now, also to keep things simple, let's say we have a camera with a gain from 0 to 100, and we've been attempting to shoot a dim and distant DSO at gain of 0. But the subframes we decide are just coming out too dim, so we decide to raise the gain by 50. 50 is half the camera's possible gain, so it interprets the brightness reference as half as long. And if the brightness reference is half as long, it means that every photon in a pixel is worth twice as much. One photon would give 20% brightness, and five photons would yield full bright. Let's go back to the notion of a pixel as a bucket for photons. How many photons the pixel bucket can hold is called its well depth and the maximum capacity of that depth is called the full well. If the bucket fills up with photons, the pixel will be interpreted as full bright. The chart above is for the Player One Ares M astrophotography camera. All the way top left, you can see that its full well is 73,289, meaning that each pixel of the Player One Ares M camera can hold 73,289 photons. At zero photons, the pixel would be black, and at 73,289 photons, the pixel would be fully bright. But the chart also shows that as gain increases, the full well decreases. Using what we have learned so far, we can understand why. The actual full well of the pixels remains the same regardless of whatever gain you're shooting at. But since increasing gain causes the camera to shorten its brightness reference, it takes fewer photons to bring a pixel to complete brightness at full well. Looking on the chart, we can see that at a gain of 90, the full well of each pixel is only 25,644 about one-third of the full well at zero gain. So we can say that at a gain of 90 on the Player One Ares M camera, the camera is assigning three times the value of brightness for every photon falling into it. And so, once 25,644 photons have fallen into a pixel, that pixel goes to a brightness value of full bright. Technically, the physical capacity of its full well has remained unchanged. It's still 73,289. But at a gain of 90, once a pixel has 25,644 photons in it, the camera's computer will interpret that pixel as 100% bright. It can't get any brighter. So any further photons falling into the pixel at that time would simply go to waste. 
Generally, you would like to keep pixels away from full bright, and we can see why in this mosaic that I shot last year of the Andromeda Galaxy. The pixels of the core of the galaxy are saturated with photons. They are at full bright, so we've lost information. For example, we can't see detail, such as dust lanes. A related chart shows the Player 1M's dynamic range. For an Astro camera, it has an impressive dynamic range. At zero gain, it's 13.7, but at the camera's maximum gain of 450, its dynamic range is only 8.6, just a little over half what it is at zero gain. We can also apply what we have learned so far about what gain does to understand how gain is affecting a camera's dynamic range. Now, if you don't already know, dynamic range is the ability of a camera to record varied levels of brightness in an image. Here is the Great Orion Nebula and a couple companion nebulae. This is an image with tremendous variation in brightness, therefore it's excellent for illustrating dynamic range. In the image, especially to the lower far left, lower far right, and near the top, roughly one third the way from the left, we find some of the blackest areas of the image. And right in the heart of the Great Orion Nebula, we find the brightest area of the image, the Tarpesium Cluster. The difference in brightness from the blackest areas to the brightest area is what is referred to as dynamic range. Shooting an image with this much dynamic range requires a camera and techniques that can capture that broad range from darkness to full bright. So when I shot this nebula, I had the camera's gain set fairly low. At 130, it's unity gain. But then I set the camera's gain to 400, virtually having its dynamic range, and that produced an image like this. The light and shadow are not nearly as well portrayed, in fact the bright areas are simply blown out. And lacking sufficient dynamic range capability, the image cannot portray all the information from the darkest to the brightest regions at the same time. In effect, the higher the gain is set, the more a camera's dynamic range capability is crushed. So, as you can see, the ability to capture a wide dynamic range is one of a camera's most important characteristics. To see how increasing gain reduces dynamic range, let's once again return to our imaginary pixel with a well depth of 10, and say that the camera is also capable of a dynamic range of 10. That is, one stop of dynamic range for every photon that a pixel captures. Of course, no actual pixel would work exactly like this. This is just for illustration purposes, but it's a functional illustration. When my gain is at zero, each photon counts for one stop of dynamic range. One photon lifts the pixel's brightness from completely black to just above black. Five photons would get our pixel to mid-brightness, and ten photons would get the pixel all the way to full bright. Now, if I were pointing a camera with these pixels at a bright target where there was plenty of light, I could use a short exposure to get sufficient photons into each pixel and create my image. But what if the image was really dim? So dim that I determined that the best way to capture an adequate exposure is to amp up my gain enough so that the brightness reference is half as long as it used to be. Now, if only five photons fall into the pixel bucket, it'll show full bright. The pixel bucket goes from zero photons equals full black to five photons equals full bright. Now recall the pixel is capable of 10 stops of dynamic range at zero gain. That is to say it can hold 10 photons and each photon can contribute enough brightness for one stop of dynamic range. But since the gain reduced our brightness reference by half, it effectively doubled the value of each photon. So now, each photon contributes twice the brightness. If at a gain of zero, each photon contributed enough brightness to raise our dynamic range by one stop, now, with a gain at 50, each photon contributes enough brightness for two stops of dynamic range. You can visualize what's happening like this. In our example, when the gain is at zero, each photon counts for one stop of dynamic range. If the gain is increased to 50, the brightness reference is halved. So, each photon counts for twice as much brightness, and that is enough brightness to fill two stops of dynamic range. As far as the camera is concerned, it's as if increasing the gain has cut its dynamic range in half. So, how does gain affect noise? Because everybody knows increasing the gain creates noise, right? Well, it could look that way, but it's incorrect. Gain doesn't put noise in an image, and in fact, gain can be beneficial for managing the camera's electronic noise. The reason gain seems to increase noise in an image is because increasing gain increases the brightness of the whole image, both the signal and the noise. Now, noise is a property of light. It is inescapable. Fortunately, noise doesn't build up as fast as the desired signal does, and the longer we capture photons from an object in space, whether that's with a few long subs or lots of short subs, we increase the desired signal at the square of the rate that noise builds up. Of course, I'm referring to the signal-to-noise ratio here, and the longer we image, the more favorable the ratio becomes, with the signal eventually overwhelming the noise. 
But if we increase gain, we are very literally getting more brightness with less signal. This makes for a lower signal to noise ratio, and the signal is no longer able to drown out the noise as effectively as before. So we see that increasing gain doesn't create noise. It just allows less signal to be interpreted more brightly, which allows for less signal collection, thus a lower SNR, which ultimately results in gain not only increasing the brightness of the desired signal, but the brightness of the noise in the signal. This also means that increasing gain is not giving any more information. There's no free lunch in photography. The only way to get more information is to spend more time collecting photons. But, while gain works against us in terms of the noise inherent in light, as seen through the signal-to-noise ratio, increasing gain can overwhelm the noise from within a camera, because that's a fixed amount of noise. And it's not inherent in the signal, so gain can be judiciously applied to overwhelm read noise, pattern noise, and other forms of camera noise. Now I mentioned in a previous video on how to shoot good flats, that despite the old adage that you needed to shoot flats at the same gain at which you shot your subs, I have found flats work just fine at other gains. It may have been very important to shoot flats at the same gain with older sensors, but with the latest generation of sensors, at or above 5xx in my experience, I just haven't found gains to be all that important for flats. In point of fact, after a night of astrophotography, I almost always just shoot sky flats. It's quicker and easier than messing with flat devices. And I usually shoot my sky flats about an hour after dawn to make sure I don't get any stars in the flats. Now during the night, when shooting whatever DSO I'm targeting, I almost always have the gain set for Unity. And trying to shoot sky flats an hour after dawn at Unity would be impossible. The camera just isn't capable of fast enough shutter speeds to handle it, and the pixels would saturate, not giving a flat, just an all-white field. So I set the camera gain to 10 and let the Nina Flat Wizard do its stuff. And doing this, I always come out with perfectly serviceable flats, both for my SCT and my refractor. What I have found is that with the newer sensors, what really matters is trying to match dynamic range more closely. For example, shooting at unity gain gives me a dynamic range of about 13.5, and so does shooting at 10 gain. So I think if you make it a point to keep your dynamic ranges roughly matched, and shoot flats with a light curve one quarter to one half to the left of the histogram, then you can get reliably serviceable flats at different gains. Well, we could go a lot deeper into this topic, into gain and its relationship to many other aspects of astrophotography. We haven't even had a chance to touch upon important topics such as unity gain, or the really important differences between analog gain on one side of this equation and the digital gain on the other. But this video is already pretty long, and if I were to push down all those rabbit holes, we'd be at this for a lot longer. So this video is intended to provide a general, functional understanding of what gain does to images, which may help you in your application of it. And those other areas will have to be topics for other videos. And if you have any thoughts or observations, please leave them in the comments section below. And if you enjoy what you see, please take a moment to like and subscribe. And above all, remember to get out there at every opportunity and shoot that sky.